Hi everyone, this is Professor M. Das Science and today we will discuss the spectral series of the hydrogen atom in another one of our videos on rigorous quantum mechanics. When an atom transitions from a higher to a lower energy state, it emits a photon. The study of these emitted photons is the subject of spectroscopy, which provides key insights into the atomic energy levels. The emission spectrum of the hydrogen atom was actually discovered before the development of a full atomic theory, and it therefore played a key role in the development of quantum mechanics. For historical reasons, the emission spectrum of hydrogen is divided into series, which depend on the energy levels that are involved. You may have actually heard of some of these series, for example, the Lyman series or the Balmer series. In this video, we are going to show how the emission spectrum of hydrogen emerges from the quantum mechanical description of the system. And we will also explore some interesting features of the hydrogen spectral series, such as how they lead to the red color that we see in cosmic nebulas. So let's go. The hydrogen atom is made of two particles, a proton and an electron. In our earlier videos on hydrogen, we found that the key physics of the system is encoded by the relative motion of the proton and the electron. That means that we can describe the hydrogen atom with a one particle relative Hamiltonian H with the usual kinetic energy term and a potential energy term that describes the Coulomb interaction. In the position representation, we can rewrite it with the usual kinetic energy term gradient and the potential energy term, which has the form of a central potential. For a full derivation, you should check out the introductory video on the hydrogen atom but just to remind you, mu here is the reduced mass of the system and is related to the masses of the proton and electron by this equation. P here is the relative momentum given by this expression in terms of the individual momenta of the proton and the electron. And R is the relative position, which is given by the distance between the proton and the electron. So starting with this relative Hamiltonian, we can write its eigenvalue equation like this, where as usual, these are the eigenvalues and these are the eigenfunctions. We've solved this eigenvalue equation to determine all the bound states of the hydrogen atom in a series of very mathematical videos that we've linked in the description, and you should go there and check them out for all of the details. What we will do today is to focus on the eigenvalues. In our mathematical solution, we found that the energy eigenvalues En are given by minus Ei over N squared. Ei is called the ionization energy and is given by this expression in terms of the reduced mass of the proton-electron system and some fundamental physical constants. Its numerical value is about 13.6 electron volts. And additionally, the quantum number N, called the principal quantum number, can only take positive integer values and labels the different energy eigenvalues of hydrogen. Again, do check out the videos linked in the description for the full details behind these expressions. Starting from these energy eigenvalues, the aim of today's video is to explore the emission spectrum of the hydrogen atom. When an atom transitions from a high energy eigenstate to a lower energy eigenstate, a photon is emitted whose energy is equal to the energy difference between the two states. The collection of all possible emitted photons is called the emission spectrum of the atom, and the study of these emitted photons is the subject of spectroscopy, which provides key information about the atomic energy levels. In today's video, we will explore the emission spectrum of the hydrogen atom, which played a key role in the development of quantum theory. We're going to consider a hydrogen atom in an initial energy eigenstate N2 and a final energy eigenstate N1. The transition between the two states is accompanied by the emission of a photon, and we will label its energy with delta E. Note that for emission, we always need N2 to be larger than N1. The energy of the photon is equal to the energy difference between the two energy levels and can be written as En2 minus En1. Using the expression for the energy eigenvalues at the top here, we can rewrite it as this expression for En2 minus this expression for En1. 
Rearranging, we end up with the ionization energy multiplying 1 over n1 squared minus 1 over n2 squared. This means that when the hydrogen atom transitions from energy level n2 to energy level n1, a photon of this energy delta E is emitted. It is common practice to describe the emitted photon using its wavelength rather than its energy, so we will now convert this expression accordingly. Remember that we can relate the energy and wavelength of a photon via this equation, which involves the Planck constant h and the speed of light c. We can next insert this expression for the photon energy into this expression, and we end up with this equation. Rearranging, we find that the inverse wavelength is equal to this prefactor times 1 over n1 squared minus 1 over n2 squared. We now collect the prefactor here into a new constant, Rh, and with this we arrive at the Rydberg formula, which gives us the inverse of the emitted photon wavelength as equal to this expression. And remember that n2 is larger than n1 for emission. The Rydberg formula is named after Johannes Rydberg, who first proposed it empirically in 1888, before the development of quantum mechanics. Our approach today has been from the bottom up, and we've derived the Rydberg formula from the basic quantum properties of the hydrogen atom. So the constant Rh here is called the Rydberg constant, so let's copy it down. Remembering the expression we have for the ionization energy, we can use it to rewrite the Rydberg constant like this. Remembering that h bar is equal to h over 2 pi, we can combine these terms to get 4h squared, and we end up with this alternative expression for Rh. The Rydberg constant was first introduced empirically as a fitting parameter to the observed emission spectrum of hydrogen, and only later was it related to the fundamental constants as we have right here in front of us. To determine the numerical value of the Rydberg constant, we just need a few values. The effective mass mu of the proton-electron system is equal to 9.104 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, and we derive this value in detail in the video on the ground state of the hydrogen atom. We also need the fundamental charge E equal to 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulomb, the permittivity of free space, which is equal to 8.854 times 10 to the minus 12 meters to the power of minus 3, kilogram to the power of minus 1, second to the power of 4, and ampere squared. Then the Planck constant is equal to 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule second, and the speed of light, which is equal to 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Using these numerical values, and in fact using a few more significant figures than those shown here, we find that the Rydberg constant up here is approximately equal to 1.09678 time tends to the 7 inverse meter. This is the Rydberg constant associated with a hydrogen atom, and it is the one that we will use today. However, as a quick aside, in your study of atomic physics, you will often encounter a related constant, which is also, confusingly, called the Rydberg constant, but it's labelled as R infinity. R infinity is simply the Rydberg constant in the limit that the reduced mass of the proton-electron system tends to the electron mass. An alternative but equivalent way to think of this is that it's the limit in which the proton mass becomes infinitely large, which is often useful to conceptually understand the behaviour of the hydrogen atom, as then we can just view it as simply an electron moving around a stationary proton. So in this context, we can write the new Rydberg constant as equal to this expression, where we are simply replacing the reduced mass by the electron mass. And its numerical value is 1.09737 times 10 to the 7 inverse meter, so really close to the value of Rh. 
So we can use this expression to determine the wavelength of an emitted photon when the hydrogen atom transitions from energy level N2 to energy level N1. The different values that N1 and N2 can take give many possible photon wavelengths, and the collection of all of these is called the emission spectrum of hydrogen. Historically, the emission spectrum of hydrogen has been divided into groups called series. Each emission series, which is also called spectral series, is characterized by the level N1 in which the atom ends up after the transition. So in the rest of the video, we will go over the few possible values of N1 to study the most famous spectral series of hydrogen. Let's start with N1 equals 1, which is the ground state. This spectral series therefore corresponds to transitions from any excited state to the ground state, and it's called the Lyman series, and it was discovered by Theodore Lyman in 1906. If we insert n1 equals 1 into the expression at the top, we get that the inverse photon wavelength is equal to the Rydberg constant times 1 minus 1 over n2 squared. And as n2 must be larger than n1, it can take any value starting from 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on in integer steps. Let's draw a table with n2 in the first column and the wavelength in the second column. As is conventionally done, we're going to use nanometers as the unit of length. And just as a quick reminder, one nanometer is equal to 10 to the minus 9 meters. All we have to do to get the wavelengths of the Lyman series is to insert the numerical values into this expression, and we will go straight to the answer. When the hydrogen atom is in the first excited state, then N2 equals 2. In this case, we get a wavelength of 1 to 1.56 nanometers. When the hydrogen atom is in the second excited state, we have N2 equals 3. In this case, we have an emitted photon wavelength of 102.57 nanometers. For N2 equals 4, we get 97.25 nanometers. For N2 equals 5, we get 94.97 nanometers. For n2 equals 6, we get 93.78 nanometers. And we could go on like this, and eventually, in the limit of very large n2, the wavelength tends to 91.17 nanometers. Each of these transitions corresponds to a spectral line in the emission spectrum of hydrogen, and together they form the Lyman series. The different lines within the series are labelled by Greek letters in alphabetical order. So the first would be the Lyman alpha line, the second would be the Lyman beta line, then the Lyman gamma, then the Lyman delta, then the Lyman epsilon, and so on. The final one is called the Lyman limit, which is the photon wavelength that caps the Lyman series. Let's remember the expression for the photon energy. For the Lyman series with n1 equals 1, then when n2 becomes very large, we end up with the photon energy tending to the ionization energy. This makes perfect sense. The Lyman series corresponds to transitions to the ground state, and the binding energy of the ground state is the ionization energy. Therefore, if we have a hydrogen atom with n2 tending to infinity, it means that this atom is at the limit of being bound, so its transition to the ground state will release a photon whose energy is equal to the ionization energy. We're now going to draw the spectral series of hydrogen. Let's draw a horizontal line which corresponds to the photon wavelength. As a reference, we're going to include the visible spectrum, which runs roughly between 400 nanometers and 700 nanometers. For lower wavelengths, we get the ultraviolet or UV region, and for longer wavelengths, we get the infrared or IR region. We're now going to draw the Lyman series on this axis. So from the previous slide, we can place the first line in the Lyman series, the Lyman alpha line here, as it corresponds to 121.56 nanometers. This places it well within the UV range. We can also place the second line here, the third here, the fourth, the fifth, 
and so on, all the way to the Lyman limit, which is here, and corresponds to 91.17 nanometers. This diagram shows that the entire Lyman series falls within the UV range of the electromagnetic spectrum. As none of the lines are in the visible part of the spectrum, the Lyman series was not the first one to be discovered historically. That honour corresponded to the Balmer series. The Balmer series corresponds to transitions from higher excited state to the first excited state, which is N1 equals 2. Some of these spectral lines in the series had been known for a while, but it is named after Johann Balmer, who discovered an empirical formula to relate the different wavelengths in this series in 1885. The formula discovered by Balmer is simply a special case of the Rydberg formula. If we insert n1 equals 2 into the Rydberg formula at the top, we get that the inverse photon wavelength is equal to the Rydberg constant times 1 over 4 minus 1 over n2 squared. And as n2 must be larger than n1, it can take any value starting from 3, 4, 5, 6 and so on in integer steps. So let's again draw a table with n2 in the first column and the wavelength in the second column, again using nanometers as the unit of length. The series starts at n2 equals 3, which gives a wavelength of 656.46 nanometers. N2 equals 4 gives 486.27 nanometers. N2 equals 5 gives 434.19 nanometers. N2 equals 6 gives 410.29 nanometer. And uh, N2 equals 7 gives 397.12 nanometers. We could go on like this, and eventually, in the limit of very large N2, the wavelength tends to 364.84 nanometers. Each of these transitions corresponds to a spectral line in the emission spectrum of hydrogen, and they all together form the Balmer series. Using the same convention that we had for the Lineman series, the first line would be the Balmer alpha line, then Balmer beta, then Balmer gamma, and so on. However, the Balmer series is sometimes also simply labelled by the chemical symbol for the hydrogen atom, so that the first line would be the H-alpha, the second would be the H-beta, then H-gamma, and so on. The reason why the symbol H is also used for the Balmer series is because this was the first hydrogen spectral series that was discovered. So let's go back to our picture of the electromagnetic spectrum. We're now going to draw the Balmer series. We can place the first line in the Balmer series, the Balmer alpha line, right here, as it corresponds to 656.46 nanometers. This places it within the visible spectrum, with a red colour. We can place the second line here, and it also falls within the visible spectrum, in particular it will have a blue colour. The third goes here, and it will be violet. The fourth goes here, and it's also violet. The fifth line falls here, and it is really close to the boundary between the visible and the UV parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. We could go on like this, and we would reach the Balmer limit, which falls right here at 364.84 nanometers. This diagram shows that the first few lines of the Balmer series fall within the visible range of the electromagnetic spectrum, and these lines were the first emission lines of hydrogen to be discovered. The series then goes into the UV region of the spectrum, where it ends. If we were to look with the naked eye at the emission spectrum of the large-scale structures of the universe, such as nebulous, then the first line of the Balmer series, the H-alpha line in the red region here, would be really prominent. Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe, and as such, its emission lines in the visible range of the electromagnetic spectrum tell us a lot about what the universe looks like to the naked eye. For example, the H-alpha line gives the red colour that is so commonly seen in star-forming nebulas, such as the Orion Nebula that you can see all around me. You can now probably see how the rest of the story unravels. The next spectral series corresponds to N1 equals 3, 
and it's called the Passion Series, named after Friedrich Passion, who discovered it in 1908. Going straight to the table, this time I will skip the details and directly fill it in for the first few lines of the series, all the way to the limiting line. So going back to our picture of the electromagnetic spectrum, we have now zoomed out from our previous version to be able to fit it to the new series. Including the Passion series, it starts here at around 1880 nanometers, and it goes on like this, terminating here at around 820 nanometers. This places the entire Passion series within the infrared region of the electromagnetic spectrum. The next spectral series corresponds to N1 equals 4, and it's called the Brackett series, named after Friedrich Brackett, who discovered it in 1922. Going straight to the table, we can fill it up in the usual way. So now we go back to our plot of the electromagnetic spectrum, and we have again zoomed out to be able to fit the new series, the Brackett series, which starts at around 4050 nanometers and goes on like this, terminating at around 1,460 nanometers. This places the entire bracket series within the infrared region of the electromagnetic spectrum, and we see that the bracket series overlaps with the previous series, which is the Passion series. The next spectral series corresponds to N1 equals 5, and it's called the Fund series, named after August Fund, who discovered it in 1924. Going straight to the table, we can fill it up in the usual way. And then we go back to the plot of the electromagnetic spectrum. We have the usual zoom out, and now we will add the Fund series. It starts at around 7,460 nanometers, and it goes on like this, and it terminates at around 2,290 nanometers. This places the entire Fund series within the infrared region of the electromagnetic spectrum, and we see that it overlaps with the previous series. The next spectral series corresponds to N1 equals 6, and it's called the Humphrey series, named after Curtis Humphreys, who discovered it in 1953. And we complete the table in the usual way. Going back to our figure of the electromagnetic spectrum, we will now add the Humphrey series. It starts at around 12,370 nanometers, and it goes on like this, terminating at around 3,290 nanometers. And this places the entire Humphrey series within the infrared region of the electromagnetic spectrum, and we see that it also overlaps with the previous series. We could honestly go on like this for higher values of N1, but the subsequent series no longer have specific names, so we won't go on. But you can do it yourself if you want, by simply using the Rydberg formula as we've been doing for the series that are shown in the diagram. To finish, we're going to talk about how the spectral series that we've discussed today are not the full story regarding the emission spectrum of the hydrogen atom. In our study of the hydrogen atom so far, we've been using a non-relativistic Hamiltonian. Although relativistic effects are small in hydrogen, modern spectroscopic techniques do allow us to measure the small relativistic corrections to the predictions that arise from the non-relativistic Hamiltonian that we've been discussing today. These relativistic terms lead to the so-called fine structure and hyperfine structure of hydrogen. The fine structure leads to the splitting of some of the spectral lines we've been discussing today into closely spaced lines. The hyperfine structure also leads to additional lines, a very prominent one being this 21 cm hydrogen line. This hydrogen line is frequently observed in this radio astronomy because electromagnetic radiation of this wavelength can penetrate interstellar dust while, for example, visible light cannot do so. The spectral series of hydrogen played a crucial role in the development of the quantum theory. Today we've seen how they emerge from a basic understanding of the energy levels of hydrogen. And that's where we're going to stop today. And as always, if you like the video, please subscribe.